Alrighty guys, this is my first attempt at recording a video like this, so if it's awkward, my apologies, bear with me. Also, it's probably going to be very long, and I don't expect you to sit through it all in one seating. That would be a little bit overload for your brain, so please feel free to pause it and then restart. Maybe do it in like 30 minute or one hour chunks, <clears throat> but I'm just going to go ahead and and bulldoze through the whole first chapter so it's all in one video. Okay, chapter one of chemistry. Let's go. It's all about matter and measurement. So chemistry is a natural science. Um, it is a science that studies the natural world and things that are in it. Um, it is closely related to other sciences like biology or physics or um, computer science and math, uh, material science, medicine, all of those things rely on a basic understanding of chemistry. You can see chemistry is right here in the center, which is why chemistry is often referred to as the central science. The central science. So this class is actually gonna give you foundational knowledge that's important in any of those fields that you want to go into. There are multiple branches of chemistry. We really won't delve into them, but all of the fundamentals you need in order to study those other branches of chemistry and progress in the field of chemistry, so like organic chemistry, biochemistry, inorganic chemistry, um, physical chemistry, all right, those are all different fields within chemistry that you can specialize in if you're a chemist. We will mostly be focusing on inorganic chemistry this semester. So all sciences rely on research, and research is conducted through a stepwise, systematic stepwise process known as the scientific method. Sorry for my chicken scratch. You'll get used to it and I'll get better at it, hopefully. Okay, so the first step of the scientific method is actually making observations. Observations about the world around you, about phenomenon or processes that you see that you don't have an explanation for. And so observations lead to questions. Um, and observations can be qualitative, meaning that they are descriptive like oh the sky is blue I wonder why the sky is blue All right blue color is a description of something All right but um, observations can also be quantitative Hopefully your notes are neater than mine. Um, and quantitative means that they are measurable. You can actually get a measurement. So like, uh, I wonder how far the moon is from the earth. That is something that you could measure. Um, or why are, you know, two trees, different sizes or something like that. And you have data that is quantitative measurements. So once you have your observation and you form a question, you can make an educated guess to answer that question. And that's called a hypothesis. All right, and in order to determine whether your hypothesis is correct, your guess about your observation, you need to devise experiments. And experiments are, they're tests that um, the goal is to prove or disprove the hypothesis, to see if your hypothesis is correct. All right, so this, this process is very cyclical. You, ident you make observations and ask a question, 
All right, so that's somewhere in here. You form a guess about what causes that phenomenon or answers that question. That's your hypothesis. Then you test the hypothesis doing an experiment and you get data from that experiment. And if the data agrees with your hypothesis, you don't just say, woo, I was right. You repeat, all right? Repetition is a key in the scientific process. If your data did not agree with your hypothesis, then you return to your hypothesis formation stage and you come up with a new hypothesis and you test that. So there's a lot of cycling, all right? So if you have a lot of experiments that support your hypothesis, then you might be able to develop a scientific law. Develop, let's just say develop a scientific law. Right, and a scientific law is usually like one sentence, two sentences, it's a concise statement, or sometimes it's an equation that is always true. Um, so like gravity is a scientific law. Um, the first law of thermodynamics, gravity is actually a theory, um, but the first law of thermodynamics or the law of conservation of mass, that mass can't be created or destroyed. Multiple experiments have shown evidence and multiple different researchers, different types of experiments always result in that same conclusion. And so when you have so many experiments that keep giving the same result or supporting the same hypothesis, that hypothesis basically becomes a law, becomes a truth. Um, you can also establish theories, a scientific theory. And a sci in science, a theory is actually a very well-founded idea. So it's an explanation of why that's based on repeatable evidence, all right? So gravity is one I mentioned before. You throw something up, it comes down, all right? Things are pulled towards the earth. Things with mass are pulled towards the earth. Um, and this is repeatable. And so um, a scientific theory is not, is not a, like a, an, oh, this vague idea, like it is in colloquial English. And we say, oh, I have a theory about that. When we use the word theory in regular everyday language, what we're really saying is, is we're using it in place of hypothesis. We're saying, oh, I have a guess about this. But in science, a theory is actually well-founded. So it is not a loose idea. All right. And if you really want to be correct when you use English, instead of saying you have a theory about something, you should say you have a hypothesis. So that's really what you mean theory is actually very well founded. All right, so chemistry is actually defined as the study of matter. And matter is defined as anything that has mass and volume. So it weighs something and it takes up space. All right? Matter, something else to know about matter that's a theme throughout the course is that matter is particulate. In other words, it's made of little particles. Those little particles have names and parts and we'll get to all that soon enough. So in the study of chemistry, we study a few things about matter. One of the things we'll study is the properties of matter. Pro we will study the changes that matter can undergo, physical and chemical changes of matter. And we also will study the energy associated with those changes. All right. So the first thing uh, we can talk about with properties of matter, we can talk about their physical states. 
we can classify matter by physical states or sometimes called the phases of matter. So the three phases of matter are of course solid, liquid, and gas. There's also another one called plasma. We won't get into that. That's more physics-y. So solids are made up of closely packed molecules or atoms that are very tightly packed together and therefore solids have a fixed shape and also a fixed volume. All right, and they're not compressible. You can't squish them. Liquids are loosely packed, so they're still together, but they can kind of roll around each other. And so that gives them a flexible shape, but still a fixed volume. So you can take a beaker of water and you can pour it into containers of different shapes and the water will always take the shape of the container. It has a flexible shape, but the volume of the water will be the same. If you have, you know, a cup of water, it will be one cup of water in every container, just will have a different shape. Liquids are also not compressible. Their particles are still pretty closely packed. In a gas, the particles are very spread apart and actually flying around really fast. And so that gives gases both a flexible shape and a flexible volume because they are compressible. You can compress them to a smaller volume or you can reduce the pressure and they have a larger volume. So those are the different states of matter. You can also classify matter based on pure substances versus mixtures. So let's first talk about pure substances. Pure substances. All right, so pure substances have definite and unchanging composition. All right, they are defined. The two types of pure substances are elements and compounds. So um, an element is sort of the base unit of matter. Um, they are substances that can't be broken down any further. Um, and elements can be, this, the base unit of an element is an atom. All right, atoms are single particles of an element. Some elements, like their atoms like to stick together um, and prefer to stick stick together and not be single and all alone. And when we have any type of substance that's made of multiple atoms bonded together, we call those molecules. So that's some terminology to keep straight. Atoms are single particles of an element and molecules are when you have multiple atoms bonded together. If they are atoms of the same element, then it's still an element. So for example, some examples of elements that I could give you um, are, let's say, helium. And helium likes to be by itself, it's a loner. Um, sodium, most of the metals, metals can be individual atoms for sure. Um, but some that kind of like to stick together, oxygen, uh, when the oxygen that you breathe, oxygen in the air, is actually O2. It's two atoms of oxygen that are bonded together, so it's a molecule of oxygen. Um, another molecular element is sulfur. A very common form of sulfur is S6, six atoms of, of sulfur bonded together. But since it's all sulfur atoms, even though there's six of them, it's still pure element. These are all pure elements. All right. For compounds, um, compounds are, are molecules that are composed of two or more elements. So um, some examples of some compounds are sodium chloride, which is table salt. It's one atom of sodium and one atom of chlorine bonded together. 
water, another common substance, H2O, two atoms of hydrogen, one atom of oxygen, and let's go with glucose, C6H12O6, slightly larger molecule. It's got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms in it. All right, so the difference between NaCl and O2 is that O2 is just one type of element, whereas NaCl, H2O, all these have two or more types of elements. So when you have two or more types of elements, we're talking about a compound, right? So moving on, little practice problem here. First, we're gonna indicate whether each of these is an atom or a molecule, and then we'll indicate whether it's an element or a compound. So hydrogen is made up of two atoms, so that means it's a molecule. I'm just gonna put moloch. And methane also has multiple atoms, so it's a molecule. Ozone, three oxygen atoms, that's a molecule. Helium is the only loner, single one here, so this is an atom. And water, H2O, is a molecule. All right, are they elements or compounds? Elements, remember, are pure, just made up of one substance. H2, although it's two atoms, it's two of the same atoms. So this is an element. Methane has two different types of atoms. That's a compound. Ozone is just one type of atom. So that's gonna be an element. Helium, an element. And water, we already said as an example, that it's a compound. So notice that you can have um, elements that are molecular or elements that are just a single atom, all right? But all the compounds are molecular. You can't have an atomic, an atom of a compound because by definition, compounds have two or more parts. So all of the units, like sort of the, the simplest unit of a compound is a molecule. Alrighty, so that's just some terminology. Um, those are the pure substances, elements and compounds. Now for the mixtures. Mixtures are combinations of two or more things that, um, but they still retain their identity. So basically they're not bonded together. Uh, and like water, for example, is not a mixture because the oxygen and the hydrogen are bonded together. And water has very different properties than hydrogen, pure hydrogen and pure oxygen. But if you just mixed hydrogen and oxygen together, the gases in a mixture, that would be very different than if you had water. So a mixture of two things is when they're still two separate things that retain their own identity. So the two types of mixtures that we can have are a homogeneous mixture. Homo means same. Homogene, no, I'm spelling it wrong. Homogene us. All right, so homogeneous mixtures, they have the same composition throughout. So this glass of iced tea all right, if I just show you this part of it, the T, all right, is homogeneous. It looks the same throughout, it's the same color. Um, salt water, coffee, lots of beverages are good examples. Um, but not all mixtures are liquids. You can have gaseous mixtures. I talked about hydrogen and oxygen being mixed together. Air is a mixture of several different gases, but they're you know mixed evenly together. Brass, is, you can have solid mixtures as well. A lot of jewelry metals are, or actually there's a lot of metals for a lot of different purposes that are actually alloys, that are combinations or mixtures of different metals that are blended together. Um, the other type of mixture is a heterogeneous, heterogeneous, all right? And hetero means different. So heterogeneous mixtures have different composition, like so you can see the different things in it. Um, if I bring back this iced tea and I show you the ice, 
we consider the ice part of the mixture, all right, then this would be a heterogeneous mixture. Clearly the ice and the tea are separate. Well, have a drink while I'm at it. All right, so um, other things, a lot of foods here. I like to use foods, I guess, as examples. Salads, vegetable soup, cookie dough, lots of ice cream flavors are heterogeneous. Um, vanilla would be homogeneous, I would say. Um, and chocolate would be homogeneous, but anything with mix-ins would be heterogeneous. Soil is also another good one in the natural world that is heterogeneous. If you take a scoop of soil, you can see lots of particulates in it. It's not just this solid brown material. There's little pieces of twigs and sticks and stuff. Worms. All right, so those are different ways we can classify matter as either a mixture or a pure substance. And with mixtures, we've got either heterogeneous or homogeneous. And with pure substances, we have elements or compounds. And some of the homework problems will just be practicing classifying matter. Now for some properties of matter, another thing chemistry studies. So there's different types of properties. We have physical properties. Excuse me, physical properties. That's not so neat. Those can be observed without changing the substance's identity. So you can observe the color of something or the smell, the odor it gives off. Um, you can heat it up and observe what its boiling point is. You can calculate its density. All right, all of these things are physical properties. They also have chemical properties. Matter has chemical properties. And those are basically the different ways that, that the chemical will react with other things. So for example, hydrogen gas is very flammable. It um, takes a very little bit of energy for it to burst into flame and combust and burn in oxygen, um, whereas other other objects really are not. Um, so it has to do with how chemicals react with other chemicals. Other examples, iron, rusting. Iron also reacts with oxygen in a not so great way and it turns into rust. It becomes oxidized. Whereas other metals do not react so much with oxygen and degrade the way that iron does. So that would be their chemical properties. Other types of properties, we can say that there are intensive intensive properties versus extensive extensive properties. Intensive properties um, do not depend on the amount of substance that you have. So if you have a block of metal, let's say iron, okay, the density of that block of metal is not going to change. If you have three blocks of, of iron, okay, the density of each is going to be the same because the density of iron is defined. So it doesn't matter how much iron you have, the density of it will always be the same. Um, temperature as well. If you have a um, little coffee cup full of water, or you have a big pot full of water, you could take the temperature of each, they're the same, it doesn't matter how much water is present. Heat, however, is an extensive property. So extensive properties do depend on the amount of some, something that you have. So weight and volume or mass and volume are very classic extensive properties. That cup of, of water is going to weigh different have a different mass and a different volume than that big pot of water, right? They also have different amounts of heat. Heat is a measure of energy in something. So there's there's less heat in that cup of water than in that boiling, that big pot of water. If, if you have hot water, if that boiling pot of water that's full of boiling water, okay, if a little, a little drop of water splashed out on your skin, 
it would be like, ow, ow, but you'd be fine. If the whole pot of water spilled on you, you'd have like second degree burns. It'd do a lot more damage because there's a lot more heat stored in that larger mass of water. So extensive properties depend on how much of something you have. Um, we said that chemistry is also the study of changes in matter. So matter can undergo physical changes. Physical change or reactions. And we abbreviate reactions as Rxn in chemistry. So physical changes or physical reactions um, are what happens when atoms or molecules change their state, their physical state, or um, like a block of metal gets reshaped. Okay, that's a physical reaction. So it, it's changing its shape or its state, but it's not changing its identity. It still is the same chemical. Versus chemical changes, chemical changes or chemical reactions. All right, what happens in that situation is the chemicals are actually undergoing um, rearrangement. So the, the atoms rearrange themselves to form new chemicals. So if you had hydrogen H2 and oxygen O2 reacting to form water H2O, all right, that's a rearrangement. Atoms are disconnecting and reconnecting in new configurations. You're making new substances. They transform into new or different substances, and that is a chemical change. So we'll learn more about those in chapters to come. Um, so that's a bit about the properties and changes of, of matter. Um, in order to record all of those things and observe all those things, we really need to be able to measure a lot of those, those properties, um, measure mass and volume and density. And so we're going to spend a lot of this chapter talking about math and measurements. So all measurements will, of course, include a number, a number value but they also need to include a unit, right? Numbers in chemistry should never be, almost never be reported without a unit. So I will drill this into your brains. Don't forget your units when you do a problem. The a number is not enough. So the measuring system that we use in science and in chemistry certainly is the international system of units. They're also called SI units which I think stands for System International, which is just the French for International System Units. And they come from the metric system. So some of the base units to know for mass, the base unit of mass is kilogram. And the symbol for kilogram is just kg, and that's a lowercase k. Length, the base unit is a meter and the symbol for meter is just a lowercase m. The base unit for time is seconds and the symbol for that is s or sometimes sec, sec. For temperature the base unit, the international unit, is actually Kelvin which is a capital K is the symbol and for vol or sorry for amount of a substance we use a unit called the mole and we'll get to that in another chapter um, and it's abbreviated mol not much of an abbreviation there and then the unit the international unit for volume is the liter and its symbol is a capital l all right so these are important to know we're not going to be using for mass, we're not going to be weighing things in pounds or ounces, and we're not going to be measuring length in feet and inches, and so on and so forth. So we're, we're using the metric system of units. Um, the metric system is very convenient because 
And instead of having these arbitrary things like inches and feet and yards, um, it's on a, it's a base 10 system. So um, it uses a series of prefixes, metric prefixes, um, that help to indicate which base 10 multiplier you are using. So for example, kilo is a prefix that means a thousand. And so if you have a kilometer, kilometer, that means you have a thousand meters, kilometer. So one kilometer is by definition a thousand meters. Centi means one one hundredth. So a centimeter is one one hundredth of a meter. Okay, so if you know the definitions of the prefixes, then you automatically know how many base units it's, re it's referring to. So some of the prefixes that you should commit to memory are listed here. Actually, all of these, these five are ones you should know. Mega, which means a million of something, or so in scientific notation, we would say one times 10 to the sixth. A kilo is a thousand of something. Milli is a thousandth of something. Micro is a uh, millionth of something. And nano is a billionth of something. So a micrometer is a billionth, or sorry, is a millionth of a meter. All right? Um, and you will use these regularly in unit conversions. So in this column here, I have these numbers written alternately in regular decimal form and in scientific notation. So I'm just going to give you a brief reminder or a lesson of scientific notation. It's a way, uh, it's a sort of shorthand way of writing really, really big numbers or really, really small numbers in a more convenient to work with way. And the basic format of scientific notation is C times 10 to the n power, where c is a number between 1 and 10, like 4.358, and n is an integer, a, uh, a whole number, 1, 2, 3, 23, 86, whatever. So numbers that have, that are greater than 10, like 5,400, all right, they have a positive exponent. So 5,400, if we convert that to scientific notation, is going to be 5.4 um, times 10. We can drop those zeros, those, those trailing zeros there, times 10 to the third. Right, because we move the decimal place one, two, three places. I'll show you how to do that in a second. Numbers that ha that are less than ten um, are going to have, or really, I should say, less than one, not less than ten, but less than one, will have a negative n. So 0 0.0811, all right, is going to be eight point one one times ten to the negative. Two. So notice that exponent has a negative value. So if the exponent is negative, we're talking about a really small number. If the exponent is positive, we're talking about a very large number. Um, and the exponent is just equal to the number of places the decimal is moved, as you saw I did here. So let's just do a couple of practice ones. So for 3, 5, 1, 7, we want to turn that into scientific notation then it's got to be, we got to make it a number between 1 and 10. So it's going to be 3.517. And we got that by moving the decimal place 1, 2, 3 places. So it's 3.517 times 10 to the third. The second number, again, we want to pick a number between 1 and 10. So that becomes 6.28 times 10 to the, we need to move the decimal point, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, oh, 5. I went one too many places. 
and since this is a very small number and we moved it to the right, we have a negative sign for the exponent. And then lastly, 649 billion becomes 6.49 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 10 to the 8. Right? Um, so basically what we did here, we can do the opposite if we're trying to go from scientific notation to normal decimal form. So if we move the decimal to the right, we'll move the decimal to the right if it's a positive exponent, and we move the decimal to the left if it's a negative exponent. So for this one here, 4.88 times 10 to the 4, all right, 4, 8, 8, so we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. All right, so I'll have my decimal point there. So this equals 48,800. And the one, uh, this one, 6.02, where you're going to move the decimal place to the left. So we're going to go 1, 2, 3, and I'll put zeros in those places. So what this actually is in normal notation is just 0. 0.00602. So there might be a couple of practice problems for you on that. Um, let's do one last practice problem here. Two of the following numbers are written incorrectly. Find the two that are incorrect and then write them correctly. For some of these problems, it's a good idea to just pause the video, try to do it yourself, and then start it to see what the solved answers are. So I will show you right now. The answers for this problem are C, and E are incorrectly written because they don't use integers, but or they don't use numbers between 1 and 10. So 75 is not between 1 and 10. We would need to correct that to 7.53. And we're going to add one more decimal point to that exponent, so it will be times 10 to the 3. And this one over here is not going to be 0 0.035. It will be 3.5 times 10 and we're going to take away two spaces because we had to move it two spaces to be times 10 to the 2. Okay, so that is a little brief tutorial on scientific notation for you. Alrighty, um, another thing is when you're using scientific notation or numbers are in scientific notation and you're putting them in your calculator, this is where a lot of students mess up their math because they put it in the calculator wrong. So if you have a calculator with you, or if you don't have a calculator, pause this, go get your calculator and try this and make sure you can do it correctly. So if you want to input 6.29 times 10 to the 12th into a scientific calculator, you need to type in 6.29, all right, and then you don't hit times 10 or 10 to the X or anything like that. You're going to hit either a button that says EXP or more commonly one that just says EE. All right, and then you'll hit 12. So the EE or exponent represents the times 10. Okay, times 10 to the. So you just hit 6.29 EE 12. And if you hit equals, it'll just turn that number into a a normal number. All right. So for more practice, if you're a little rusty on scientific notation and how to do calculations, like multiply numbers in scientific notation, um, I do have a worksheet posted on uh, the um, on Blackboard where you can work some practice problems and there's an answer key. So see that activity sheet for more help or more practice with scientific notation. Another thing that has to do with math that's really important in chemistry are significant figures, or as many chemists like to just call them, sig figs. Sig figs for short, or a lot of times they'll just be abbreviated as SF. All right, so, so we can categorize numbers in three different ways. We have um, counted numbers. 
painted. Right? And these are exact whole numbers. So if you're counting pennies in a jar, for example, or how many green M&Ms are in a bag, um, those are going to be reported in exact whole numbers. I suppose an M&M could break and you could end up with half an M&M, but pennies won't. So pennies, you have five pennies or ten pennies or twenty-three pennies, but you can't have twenty-three and a half pennies, right? It's always going to be a whole number. So counted numbers are exact. All right, another type of exact number are defined numbers. And these are numbers that are in definitions. Like for example, there's exactly 2.54 centimeters in one inch. There are 12 inches in a foot. All right, so those equivalencies, those are exact defined numbers. So both of these, counted numbers and defined numbers, we say they have an infinite number of significant figures. Um, but the numbers that we have to count significant figures are those that we get from measurements. So the third type of number values are those that are measured. All right. And measured numbers are inexact because they are read from a measuring device and the device itself may be imperfect and the reader may not be reading it perfectly. So there's error in both the device and the user. And so we have to express um, our level of certainty about a measurement. And that's what sig figs are for. They express our, our level of certainty. Right, so the example I sometimes use in class is um, when you look at someone and you try to guess their age. All right, you might be able to like, you might see someone walking down the street and say, oh, they look like they're in their 40s, maybe 43. You'll guess 43. Um, so you might be pretty confident that they're in their 40s, about that decade, and you're, you're adding one level of uncertainty there when you say 43 or 42 or 48. All right, so that ones digit is expressing your uncertainty, but you really can't be any certain beyond that. You can't say, oh, that person looks like they are 42 years old and three months and two days and five minutes. There's no way you can be that certain based on looking at them. And so you can't add all that specificity if you don't have a measuring device that allows you to do that. Um, so uh, in the lab, we're not necessarily trying to guess people's ages, but we are trying to record measurement values from measuring devices. And so we use a technique that is called interpolating. Interpolating or interpolation. And this is a process of estimating one digit past where we are certain. Oh, so one digit past where the markings are on a graduated instrument. So in this picture to the right here, I've got two um, graduated cylinders with the same amount of fluid in them. But we would read it differently because notice the markings on each of these is different. So this one on the left here only has markings every one millimeter or milliliter. So it's somewhere between four and five. I'm going to say that it's about 4.8, but that's as specific as I can be. I can say it's 4.8 milliliters. I know it's more than four and I know it's less than five. And so I can guess one more decimal place, one digit past the markings. In the one on the right, there are little tick marks every 0.1. So I can read pretty clearly that this is 4.8, or no, that's 4.7. That marking there is the seventh line, okay? And so I could say it's 4.70, or 4.71, or 4.72, whatever I think it is. I'm gonna be 
estimating or interpolating it out one more digit. So the more markings that are on the instrument, the more certain we can be about the volume, the less guesswork is in there. And the more digits or uh, decimal places we can estimate to. Okay, so we'll be practicing that. You, you'll be practicing that in your labs that you're doing with the measurement measuring devices that you're using. All right, so significant figures. How do we determine if a figure, if a number in an, or a digit in a number is significant or not? So there are, are rules for counting significant figures in a measured value. So rule number one is that any non-zero number, any non-zero number is significant, okay? So in 4,926, every single one of these is a non-zero number. And so there's four of those there, so we would say that this number has four sig figs. Okay, um, zeros are sometimes significant, sometimes not, and that's where it gets tricky. But zeros that are between non-zeros are always significant. So two and six are non-zeros, they're significant, and that zero sandwich between them is going to be significant. So this number we would say has three sig figs. And 4,001, since four and one are significant, all the zeros in between are also significant. So this number has four sig figs. What did I do? Four sig figs, there we go. Zeros that are on the left of a number are never significant. Okay, so here we have point zero 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 five four. Those zeros are not significant. They are placeholders. All right, so the only numbers here that are significant are the five and the four. A trick for helping you kind of dis distinguish that too is if you turn turned this into scientific notation. In scientific notation, it would be 5.4 times 10 to the one, two, three, four. 10 to the negative 4, All right? So 5.4 clearly only has two significant figures. If you wouldn't include it in scientific notation, then they're not significant, all right? So zeros on the right can be a little tricky because it's situational, all right? If there's a decimal point on the number, then zeros that are to the right are significant. So for example, 9.00, all right, it has a, the nine is significant. There's a decimal point, so both of these zeros to the right are significant. This number has three sig figs. And that's because nine, if you think about it this way, nine versus 9.00, does one have more certainty than the other? Does one express more level of detail than the other? Yes, it does. So those, des those zeros to the right there actually express more certainty and more specificity. So they are significant. 250, that zero without that decimal there, that zero would not be significant. Um, and But if we put a decimal there at the end, we can indicate that that zero is in fact significant. So that's kind of a weird way to do it. A better way would be again to write that in scientific notation, just 2.5 times 10 to the two, and that would tell us that there's only two, uh, or sorry, 2.50 times 10 to the two would tell us that this is three sig figs, All right? If there's no decimal point in the number, then those zeros are not significant. I'll say not sig figs. So 43,500, these non-zero numbers, four, three, and five are significant, but the zeros are not. So this number, although it has five digits or five figures, only three of them 
are significant. So we would say it only has three sig figs. So there will be some practice problems on that in the homework, identifying sig figs. It really takes practice. you got to practice it, practice it. And I did actually also post an extra practice worksheet with an answer key to get more practice identifying sig figs, um, which we'll also do oops, in the next couple of pages as we talk about how to um, use sig figs or maintain sig figs in calculations when you're doing calculations. Right? So it's important when you're doing calculations in chemistry that you are maintaining that level of certainty that you have from your measured values. And the rules are slightly different for multiplication and division versus addition and subtraction. So first we'll talk about multiplication and division with sig figs. So for this, the number of sig figs in the calculated value will be equal to the least amount of sig figs in any of the factors that you're multiplying. Sorry, got some heartburn. Take a little Tums break. I'm sure you wanted to know that. All right, back to chemistry. Look at me. Chemistry going on right now in my mouth, in my stomach. All right, so let's say we're taking the area of a room. So we have two measurements. We have 3.25. That has one, two, three sig figs. And we have the other side of the room is 11.565 meters. And all of those are non-zero numbers, so that is five sig figs. Um, if we multiply that in our calculator, we'll get a number answer that is 37.586 dot 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 keeps going. Okay, but because the, the, the multipliers had three sig figs or five sig figs, the answer needs to have the same number of sig figs as the least amount of sig figs in any fast factor. So in this case, our answer needs to be rounded to three sig figs. All right, so we can round that to three sig figs. It will be 37.6. So we're going to round it up point to this digit right here. The 5 will round up to 6. And remember, uh, measurements in chemistry have a number and a unit always. So our unit here, meters times meters equals meters squared. So the area of the room um, with our, our levels of certainty taken into account is 37.6 meters squared. Here's another one, find speed. It's a division problem. So we have 6.20 meters divided by 1.008 seconds. In this case, the 6 and the 2 are definitely significant. The 0 is to the right of a decimal, so it is also significant. So we have three sig figs here. And this 1 and 8 are significant. And the zeros are sandwiched between them, so they are also significant. This factor has four sig figs. All right. So whatever our answer comes out to be in our calculator, we know we need to round it to three sig figs. So it comes out to be 6.1507, yada, yada, yada. And we're going to round that to three sig figs, so it'll be 6.15. And again, we have to have our units, and our units here are going to be meters per second. So 6.15 meters per second. Okay. Um, remember that only measured values dictate the number of sig figs, and that will become apparent in some problems that we do, but we'll do a little example problem here. So an example of that would be, let's say we did this problem here, 2.375 seconds, and we want to convert that to minutes. So we multiply it by a conversion factor, which we'll talk more about in a minute, that for every one minute, there's 60 seconds. 
right? And we type that into our calculator and we get 39.58. That doesn't make any sense. That's not right. And I make mistakes sometimes. It's good when your teacher makes mistakes. I looked at that number and I thought, how could two seconds be 39 minutes? Can't be, right? Seconds are smaller than minutes. So let's uh, open up my calculator here and do some division. 2.375 divided by 60 equals 0. Let's get my pen back. 0. 0.0. 3958 dot 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 okay um minutes but that's too many sig figs there oh no actually it's not okay so you would think that one minute that one minute is one sig figs and 60 is two sig figs but this is a defined number. Remember we have different types of numbers. Different types of numbers, all right? And one minute being 60 seconds, that's a defined, that's a definition. And so we would say that it has an infinite number of sig figs, infinity, okay? So we don't need to look at those when we're calculating our sig figs. We're only looking at this guy here, which has four sig figs. And so we need an answer that has four sig figs. And the next number after eight was three in my calculator, so this is actually rounded correctly. This is an answer with four sig figs. Beautiful. All right, so there's a couple more problems for you to try here. Again, good idea to pause the video and try them yourself and then check your answers when you hit play. So I'm going to go ahead and write them in. So 6,000 divided by 2.53 would give me in my calculator 2,371.54. All right, but we've got to count sig figs. This first one, 6,000, that six is significant, but those zeros to the right are not because there's no decimal point. So this one only has one sig fig. And 2.53, these are all non-zero numbers. So this one has three sig figs. One sig fig, three sig figs. All right, so we need this answer to be only one significant figure. So we're going to round this to one significant figure, which will just be 2,000, okay? Or a better way to write that would be to write it in scientific notation, which would be two times 10 to the third, All right? The second problem, 310 divided by 125. If we type it into our calculator, we get 2.48, all right? But we need to make sure we have the right number of sig figs. Um, this number here has one, two, three, four, five sig figs. Since there's a decimal point, those zeros are significant. And 125 has one, two, three sig figs. So we need our final answer to have three sig figs, and in fact it does. So it is correct. 159.6 times 31 is 4,117 0.6 according to my calculator, but that's probably not the right number of sig figs. The first number here has four sig figs. 31 has two sig figs. So we need our final answer to have two sig figs. So, ooh, this is a problem, right? We need it to go two sig figs. So that would just be 4,000. Okay, but 4,000, that only has one sig fig. So there's no way to write this number in normal notation and have it have the right number of sig figs. 
So we have to write it in scientific notation in order to show the right number of sig figs. 4.0 times 10 to the third. It's a clear demonstration that there are two sig figs in this number. The next one, 105 times 1.4423. Uh, the calculator tells us it's 151.4415. All right, this number has three sig figs, and the second number has one, two, three, four, five sig figs. So our answer needs to have three sig figs. This is too many. If we round it to three sig figs, it will just be 151. Uh, then the next one, 0 0.0048 times 721. Our calculator tells us that is 3.4608. And this first number here, these are zeros on the left. Zeros on the left are never significant maybe some like derogatory statement about lefties or something not being significant okay well like be a mnemonic to help you remember that so only the four and the eight are so this is two sig figs and 721 is three sig figs the lesser of the two is two so we need to round this to two sig figs which would be 3.5 we round that that digit um, we're rounding it to one place after the decimal point is going to round up to 3.5. And then lastly, this last one here is in scientific notation, 1.38 times 10 to the fourth times 8.5 times 10 to the negative one. And our calculator tells us that's 11,730. All right, so this one has one, two, three sig figs. And this one has two sig figs. So in scientific notation, the sig figs just come from that C, the, the number between 1 and 10 determines the number of sig figs. So we need our answer to end up with two sig figs. So we could write it as 12,000, right? If we're rounding it to this place, that's going to round up because of the 7. Or a better way to write it would be 1.2 times 10 to the fourth. Okay, so that's a lot of practice there with sig figs. It's really important in chemistry. Um, it's something that will be would be drilled into you in any college chemistry class and is certainly important moving forward in chemistry classes or in lab research in general. Um, so it's something we'll practice in lab calculations as well. Another, the other rule is for addition and subtraction functions, which is different, a different rule, and a little more confusing in some ways. So I'm going to switch back to blue, feeling the blue. All right, so in this case, the number of sig figs is determined by how many places past the decimal point your each factor goes, not by the total number of sig figs. So let's do this first example. We've got 22.134 grams plus 0.61 grams. And if we add these together, we get 22.744. All right. But what we are going to do is sort of draw a little line. So the second number goes two places past the decimal point, And the first number goes three places past the decimal point. So the one that goes fewer places past the decimal point, that is the less significant one. My drawing is not terribly straight, okay? But basically two places past the decimal point is where this number is significant to. So we would round that to 22.74. That would be the answer here. Notice though, if we count sig figs of these numbers, this one has five sig figs, and this one has two sig figs. All right, and our answer actually has four sig figs. 
So the total number of sig figs is kind of all over the place with addition and subtraction. With addition and subtraction, what's important, what's most significant, is whichever number goes the least number of places past the decimal point. So we're looking at using the decimal point as our indicator, not the number of sig figs. Okay, let's try another one. Um, we've got 18.049 minus 11.30. That is equal to 7.349 grams. I should keep my units, like I said. All right, the, this number goes three places past the decimal. This one goes only two places past the decimal. So this number is only significant to two places past the decimal. All right, so it, we're going to round that to 7.35 grams, right? Again, the sig figs are all over the place. This number has five significant figures. This number has four significant figures, but our answer ends up only having three significant figures. Okay, but that is the correct way to do it with addition and subtraction. So the numbers of sig figs actually change. And then this last one here, we've got 3,600, sorry, 365,000 meters plus 92,300 meters is equal to 457,300 meters. And in both cases, these are significant to the ones place. Okay. Oh, wait, no, sorry, my bad. Because not all of these numbers are significant. In this number, three, six, five, oops, three, six, five are significant numbers, but those zeros, those trailing zeros there, there's no decimal point. They are not significant. So this number is only significant to the five, and same thing with the bottom number. This number is only significant to the three. So the last significant place is that hundreds place, right? So that's the last, ooh, we want to go with the one that's the least. Just keep messing myself up on this question, all right? The one that's furthest to the left. So since the second one is more specific, we need to go with the less specific one, the one that's um, further to the left, just like we did with these other two, the one that's least the least uh, places past the decimal point. Okay, so the thousandths digit is the one that this is significant to. So we would rewrite this as 457,000 or 4.57 times 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. All right, and that would be the correct answer. So there's a couple more here for you to try on your own. Pause the video and try it and then start it to see if you get it right. So 2.24, actually I'm not going to line them up. 2.24, I'm just going to mark where they are significant to. So 2.24 is significant to two places past the decimal point and 0 0.4101 is um, significant to four places past the decimal point. My calculator tells me that the answer is actually, I didn't even write down what the answer is, but just know that I want it to go two places past the decimal point. So the calculator spits out a number and I'm rounding it to 1.83. For this second one, the first number is significant to that two, which is the ten thousandths place. And this one is significant all the way to the ones, okay? But we go with the one that is less um, exact. So when we add 1,200, or sorry, 120,000 plus 425, we get 120,000 and 425. But we're rounding it to two spaces. So our answer is actually still just going to be well, let me just do the math here. So it's one, two, four, two, five. Okay, that's our answer. 
but it's only significant to here, so we have to round it to two places. So it's still really 120,000, or 1 1.2 times 10 to the 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? So sometimes that happens. You add two numbers together, but the second number is so so much smaller than the first number or so much one number is so much less significant than the other you you really can't um, change your answer that didn't make sense but it happens sometimes in lab we'll find out okay sometimes you have multi-step problems right where you have to use the order of operations PEMDAS where you have some multiplication, division, addition, subtraction, all mixed in one. And so when we're doing multi-step calculations with significant figures, it's important not to round the sig figs until the end of the problem. So you want to carry out the numbers, use the full numbers you get in your calculator um, before, and not round them during the problem. So for example, this problem here, um, we have four values. The first one, 4, 5, 6, 2, that is four sig figs. And 3.99870 is six sig figs, all of them. And this one here, all of them are significant, that's seven total. And this one here, they're all significant five total sig figs. So it's good to just kind of indicate those. All right, so we have to do things in the order of operations. So the first thing we want to do is we want to calculate, um, do the parentheses, PEMDAS, right? So first step is to do this subtraction problem here. So when we subtract these two, this one is significant out seven figures or four places past the decimal point since this is a subtraction problem. And this one is significant only two places past the decimal point. So we're going to have our answer be reported to two places past the decimal point. So if we type that into our calculator or we just do the math on paper, we get 0 0.3455, right? but it's only significant to two places past the decimal point. So we're going to round that. Oh, wait, no, I just went against what I told you to do. 3.455. We're going to keep that whole number there and we're just going to use that little dash underneath the 4 as our placeholder to remember that's the last significant digit in this number. But we don't want to round it yet because we're not done. We still have more to do in this problem. All right, the second thing we can do is we can do this multiplication here. So 4.562 times 3.5 99870 is, the calculator says 18.24206, all right, but because this one only has four sig figs, this is only significant out four digits. So I'm going to put my little placeholder there to remind me that's the last significant digit in this number. All right, so now we have this part and this part solved, so now we just need to divide those two. So step three here is to do 18.24206, don't forget our placeholder, divided by 0 0.3455, and we type that into our calculator and we get 52.79. 9. All right, but this is a division problem, and so we need to use whichever number has the least sig figs. So if we look at the sig figs here, this one has four sig figs, and this one has two sig figs. So we need to round our answer to two sig figs. So our final answer here is going to actually be 53. All right, so we if we did it if we rounded these numbers sooner, we might not get fifty three. This number would be slightly off, so we want to keep those full numbers from the calculator 
we're at least one or two places past the significant, the last significant digit. And then we just use those little dashes underneath the digit to indicate which is the last significant one. So when we get to the last step of the problem, we can figure out how many significant figures our answer has, and then we round that final answer. All right? Here's one for you to try, as in pause, and try to work it out yourself, and then see if you get it right. I will work it out now. All right, so 14.84 times 0 0.55 is in the parentheses. We'll do that part first. And I get 8.162. Since this has oh, this second number is smaller with two sig figs, I'm going to put my little placeholder under the second sig fig there. Now we'll do minus 8.02. And we get in our calculator 0. 0.142. And this number, all of them are significant, so it's significant two places past the decimal point. Now it's a, it's a subtraction problem. So in subtraction, we have to round to the nearest number past the decimal point, or the least number past the decimal point. So in this case, it will be one place past the decimal point. Oops, that's two places past the decimal point. One place past the decimal point is right here. So this number actually rounds to 0 0.1, and that's the answer. The answer has only one sig fig. Even though this number had three sig fig, or sorry, two sig figs, let me be a little clearer. Even though this number had two sig figs, technically, and this one had three sig figs, our answer only has one sig fig because it's a subtraction problem. And with subtraction, it doesn't matter the total number of sig figs, it matters the place past the decimal point. So 0.1 is our final answer there, right? There will definitely be lots of homework practice problems on calculating, doing calculations with sig figs. Alrighty then, the last big meat, meaty math part of the chapter, and that will be I mean, fundamental in your ability to pass chemistry. You really need to master this, so keep practicing it. It's okay if you don't have it down right away. You will have it down soon enough. And that is something called unit conversion. Unit conversion. That's what I like to call it. Um, more math-minded people and a lot of math textbooks call it dimensional analysis. I wrote a little too fat there, okay? Unit conversion, also known as dimensional analysis. They're the same thing, all right? So it's a way that we can convert something from one unit to another. So we, we change the number value or, or the, we're not really changing the number value, we're changing the number and the unit, but the value is still the same. All right, and so in unit conversion, we use these factors called um, conversion factors. I'm trying really hard to write neatly. Conversion factors, all right. And they're used to convert a number from one unit to another. They're written as a fraction where the numerator and the denominator are actually equal quantities that have different units. And that means thus, three dots in a triangle means thus, they are equal, these conversion factors, these, these fractions are actually equal to one. When you have the same value on top and bottom of a fraction, that's 1. 4 divided by 4 is 1. So if you multiply something by 1, you don't change its value. And so that's why we can use these, these conversion factors, these fractions, and multiply numbers by them, and we don't actually change their value. We're just changing their units. 
So we can take an equivalency, one yard equals three feet. So any, you know, X equals Y, that's an equivalency. And we can, con we can convert it into a fraction. So we could say one yard per three feet, or we could flip that and we could say three feet per one yard, you know, either or, okay? And these are conversion, this is what we refer to when we say conversion factors. These ratios or these fractions that are made from equivalencies that we can look up. Okay, so if we are gonna do some problem solving, all right, and convert things from one unit to another, how many feet are in 12.5 yards? Well, we can figure it, we can convert those yards to feet. The steps for doing these problems are pretty simple. The first thing you wanna do is you wanna identify the equivalencies you'll need. So we know that uh, one yard is equal to three feet. All right, we saw that up there. And then we want to write out the given value. So what we're given in this problem is 12.5 yards. And then we want to multiply it by a conversion factor that allows the old units to cancel out. And so we'll be left with the new unit. So in this case, we want yards to be on the bottom and feet to be on top so that our yards cancel out. So we're going to write this equivalency here. We're going to turn it into the conversion factor that says three feet is one yard. All right, 12.5 times three is 37.5 feet. Those are the units we have left. And this is correct at three sig figs because three feet and one yard, the three and the one are exact or they're defined numbers. So they have an infinite number of sig figs. So our given value, 12.5, has three sig figs. Our answer needs three sig figs. Okay, let's do another one. How many centimeters are in 8.5 feet? So we need to write down the convert or the equivalencies that we need. So centimeters, well, I can't find an equivalency in the back of the book that says how many centimeters are in a feet but I can find one that says there's 2.54 centimeters in one inch and that there are 12 inches in one foot. So I might be using two conversion factors. I will be using two conversion factors in this problem. So we start with our given value of 8.5 feet, 8.50 feet, that's a significant zero. And we're gonna multiply it by a conversion factor where feet is on the bottom. So that means I need to use this equivalency here. One foot is 12 inches. All right, but I don't want my answer in inches. I want my answer in centimeters. So now I need to multiply it by another conversion factor. And this time I want inches on bottom because I want, again, my units to cancel. Feet are canceling. Inches will cancel. So I want to use this equivalency that converts between centimeters, 2.54 centimeters for every one inch. And now I just multiply everything on top, divide by everything on bottom, and I get 2.59 centimeters. Okay, um, and it's going to be three sig figs. Again, these digits and these digits are defined so they don't we're not looking at sig figs we're not, they have infinite numbers of sig figs so it's our given number that has three sig figs that determines that our answer has three sig figs we can also do unit conversion between so these are a lot of these um, we were converting between metric units and like standard American units but you can also use it to convert between metric units so convert 0.25 milligrams to nanograms. So first, we're going to identify the equivalencies that we need. So um, milligram is a thousandth of a gram. So one uh, thousand milligrams equals a gram. All right. 
And a nanogram is one billionth of a gram, or 10 to the ninth nanograms equals one gram. I'm actually going to write my milligrams in a scientific notation as well. So a thousand is the same as 10 to the third, right? So 10 to the third milligrams is a gram, 10 to the ninth nanograms is a gram. So that means that 10 to the third milligrams is equal to 10 to the ninth nanograms, all right? So I've just combined these two since they both equal one gram and they equal each other, all right? So now in the second part of the problem, I'm gonna take the number I'm given, 0 0.25 milligrams, and I'm gonna multiply it by a conversion factor that I'm gonna make from this equivalency right here. I want milligrams on the bottom and nanograms on the top because I want my milligrams to cancel out. So 10 to the third milligrams is equal to 10 to the ninth nanograms because both of those values equal one gram. And so now I get my answer is 2.5 times 10 to the fifth, and my units are nanograms. Okay. Um, another type of unit conversion problem could involve a units that are fractional, so like rates. So for example, five miles per hour to meters per second. We're going from miles per hour to meters per second. But we're gonna use the same exact technique. So again, the first thing we wanna do is write out all of our, find all our equivalencies. So one mile um, is, um, I can't find it in meters, but I found it in kilometers. So let's do that. 1.609 kilometers. And one kilometer is a thousand meters. And um, we also need to be able to go from um, minutes to second or hours to to seconds. So I'm just going to erase this over here, giving myself a little more room. So an hour, one hour HR is equal to 60 minutes. And one minute is equal to 60 seconds, all right? So we could have a problem here where we're actually multiplying by four different conversion factors. We could simplify it a little bit if we wanted to say that 60 times 60 is 360, um, which we might want to do to simplify that and say, that in an hour, there's actually 60 times 60, 36, zero, zero, three, not 360, 3,600 seconds in an hour. Okay, so we could do that. So now we're going to set up the problem. We're always going to start with what we're given. We're given 5.0 miles per hour. Can write that as a fraction. All right, and now we need to systematically cancel out hours and miles and end up with meters per second. So let's start with getting rid of the miles. So how many kilometers are in one mile? One mile is 1.609 kilometers. Cool, our miles cancel out. And now we're going to multiply by another conversion factor that's going to help us cancel out those kilometers. So we know that one kilometer is a thousand meters. All right. And we want our thing in meters per second. So we got meters. So we're done 
on terms of the distance. Now for the time, um, we want to cancel out hours. So hours are on the bottom over here. We need them on the top in our conversion factor. So they'll cancel out. And we said that one hour is 3,600 seconds. All right, and now we have our desired time unit of seconds. So our answer, the units are going to be meters per second. Perfect. Now we just have to do the math in our calculator, which I already know I did wrong in my notes, so I'm going to redo it on my calculator here. I'm going to do 5.0 times 1.609 times 1,000 times 1 divided by 3,600. And that is a total of, and I want it to be two sig figs because our given answer, our given value has two sig figs. So it's going to be 2.2. 2.2 meters per second. Five miles per hour is the same thing as 2.2 meters per second. By the way, if you guys ever get different numbers, if you work these problems and you get different results, please message me and let me know because I am human. I do make errors all the time, actually. And in a non-live class setting, you can't call me out on it. So uh, you've got to find a way to call me out on it. Okay, one more problem for you guys to try. Pause the video. See if you can solve this one. And I'll work it out right now. If gas in Canada costs $1.23 per liter, Canadian dollars, how much does it cost in U.S. dollars per gallon? This is a helpful unit conversion if you travel to Canada because they do actually report in um, cost per liter. So the number we're given here is one, two, three um, Canadian dollars. We'll say Canadian dollars and um, per liter, per one liter. And we're just going to systematically use these equivalencies and can make conversion factors. So I'm going to start with dollars. I'll cancel out dollars. So I put Canadian dollars down here and US dollars up here. And according to this um, definition here, that one US dollar is equivalent to 1.3 to eight Canadian dollars. And of course that value is changing all the time in the real world. But that allows us to cancel out Canadian dollars and convert it to US dollars. We also need to convert liters to gallons. And according to the equivalency we're provided, 3.7854 liters is equivalent to one gallon. And I wrote it in that order because I want these liters to cancel, and if you have something on the bottom of a fraction and the top of a fraction and they're the same, they can cancel. So now it's just some multiplication. 1.23 times 3.7854 divided by 1.328 is equal to $3.51 per gallon, which is kind of pricey gas. And that's generally true. That Canadian gas, I think, is usually more expensive than U.S. gas, at least in my ex limited experience. So you'll be doing lots of practice of unit conversion problems. Another type of unit conversion, or unit that we'll convert between, are, fair, are temperature units. Though we do this using a set of um, standard formulas. So the three different temperature scales are Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. And you should memorize these values, the values on each scale at which water freezes and at which water boils. So most people in America know that water freezes at 32 degrees. That's the sort of uh, cutoff temperature in winter between ice and snow um, and rain. And water boils at a temperature of 212 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, U.S. is one of the very few countries that actually uses Fahrenheit as their temperature scale. I actually don't know if anyone else does, but I'd like to hope somebody else does, and we're not the only. Uh, 
outliers. Celsius is used most uh, around, mostly around the world as the temperature scale of choice. Um, so zero degrees Celsius is the freezing point of water, 100 deg degrees Celsius is the boiling point, much cleaner numbers, not so random. And Kelvin is a temperature scale that's really only used in chemistry for certain calculations. It is um, what we call an absolute scale. So Kelvin is an absolute scale and absolute meaning that it's positive. So there are no negative values on the Kelvin scale. You can have negative Fahrenheit and negative Celsius temperatures. Um, so there's no negative values on the Kelvin scale. And zero Kelvin is called absolute zero. Absolute zero. And it's a sort of theoretical temperature that hasn't ever been achieved. But the idea is that at absolute zero, all kinetic motion of atoms stops. Everything is totally motionless, but we haven't ever achieved a temperature as low as zero Kelvin. So Celsius and Kelvin are actually based on the same increment. In other words, one degree Celsius equals one Kelvin. They're not called degree Kelvins or Kelvin degrees. It's the only scale that doesn't have degrees. Um, but Fahrenheit is offset. So one Fahrenheit degree is, is like 1.8, or no, one Celsius degree is 1.8 Fahrenheit degrees. The degree sizes are actually different. Like if you had a thermometer that was Fahrenheit and one that was Celsius, the tick marks are going to be different. All right. So the conversions for these, the formulas, I'll just write them out here. Kelvin and Celsius have the same size degree. They're just offset. So Kelvin is Celsius plus 273.15. That's how you go from Kelvin to Celsius and Celsius to Kelvin. The formula for Celsius is whatever the temperature is in Fahrenheit minus 32 divided by 1.8. And then for Fahrenheit, to go from uh, Fahr from Celsius to Fahrenheit, it's 1.8 times the temperature in Celsius plus 32. All right, so here's a quick practice problem. Labs use freezers that are negative 80 degrees Celsius to preserve specimens. What is that temperature in both Kelvin and Fahrenheit? So I'm going to work it in red. So we have, um, let's figure out Kelvin first. So Kelvin is degrees Celsius plus 273.15. So our degrees Celsius is negative 80.0 plus 273.15, that is equal to 190. So this is an addition problem, which is going to mark my significant figures. This one is significant out to the zero there, and this one is significant out to that five. This one is one place past the decimal point, two places past the decimal point. So I want my answer to be one place past the decimal point. 193.2 Kelvin is the answer to the correct sig figs. Now for degrees Fahrenheit, we're going to use this formula here. So it's 1.8 times our degrees Celsius, which we're given as negative 80 plus 32. So I'm going to do the correct order of operations. First, I'm going to do 1.8 times negative 80, which is going to be negative 144. Since this is a multiplication problem, that 1.8 is an exact number. That's not a measured number. So it's this number that has significant figures. It has three significant figures. So this number has three significant figures, plus our 32 
Um, both of these are significant to the ones place, so our answer will be negative 112. We don't have to do any rounding or cutting out. It just is what it is. Oops, not Kelvin, but degrees Fahrenheit. All right, we're almost done, I promise. The last page of the notes is talking about an important intensive property, which is the property of density. Density. Density is something that can be measured and will be measured by you. Um, so making sure you're getting the right sig figs in your measurements is important. And density is also something that can be used as a conversion factor. So it kind of um, ties in all this math that we've just done. Density is the ratio of an object's mass to its volume. Otherwise, written in a math formula as D equals M over V, where D is density, M is mass, and V is volume. So the units of density change between different substances. Um, in liquids, the density is usually grams per milliliter. For solids, it's usually grams per centimeter cube, cubed. And for gases, it's usually grams per liter is, is a trend that you'll see. I'm not going to like test you on that. Okay. So some volume equivalencies for you, a centimeter cubed is the same thing as a milliliter and a milliliter is a thousandth of a liter. So 0 0.001 liters. All right. When we have fluids that are of different densities, the less dense one will float on top or sit on top, excuse me, which is what you see with oil and water. Oil is less dense than water. It sits on top. You can also see this with, um, with gases. I remember in my physics class, the instructor did a cool, a cool demo where he had dry ice, which is just um, solid carbon dioxide and it sublimes. So it just produces carbon dioxide gas and he put it in like an aquarium and then he blew some bubbles into the aquarium and they sort of sat and floated on top of the carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide is denser than air so the bubbles sat or float on top of it instead of falling to the bottom like you would expect. Um, all right so let's do some density calculations. Calculate the density of sulfuric acid if 25.0 milliliters has a mass of 46.0 grams. The first thing we want to do when we're using formulas um, is write it out. So density, if it wants us to calculate the density, we should write out the formula for density. Density equals mass over volume. We look at this problem and we have two values. We have 25 milliliters, right? That's a volume. And we have 46 grams, that's a mass. So we have everything we need to solve this problem. The density is just the mass, 46.0 grams, over the volume, 25.0 milliliters. And then we just divide those numbers so that we get a clean answer of 1.84 grams per milliliter. All right, so that was a very simple problem. Another way they could complicate it is they could give you a mass in kilograms or in pounds, and then you have to convert it to grams first. Um, or they give you a volume that's in like ounces, and they want you to, con so they might say calculate the density in grams per milliliter of something that's four pounds and 25 gallons. So you might have to do a little unit conversion before you can plug it in here. The other thing about density is it's a fraction. It's a mass over a volume. And so we can use it actually as a conversion factor. Um, so we can use density to figure out mass if we know the volume, or we can use uh, the density to figure out the volume if we know the mass. Did I just say the same thing twice? Essentially, D equals M over V. If you know 
any two of these, you can solve for the third one. It's algebra. Solve for the missing variable. All right, so let's do a couple of, of example problems. Calculate the mass of aluminum with a volume of 175 centimeters cubed. The density of aluminum is 2.70 grams per centimeter squared. So I'm going to do this in the conversion factor way. So the, the value we're given is 175 centimeters cubed. And then I'm going to use that, that density as a conversion factor. It is a fraction. It's fractional units, grams per centimeter cubed. So um, I want my centimeters cubed on the bottom and my grams on the top so that these will cancel out. So this density is 2.70 grams per one centimeter cubed. So the total mass of this aluminum is 473 grams, right? And I'm going by the three sig figs of the value that we're given. We're assuming that the density is an exact value and has an infinite number of sig figs. But in this case, they both had three sig figs, so our answer needs three sig figs, and it does. And then the last one for you to try here, if you want to pause the video and try it, but I will work it now. Uh, calculate the volume occupied by 93.2 gram salt sample, and it tells us the density. In this case, we want grams on the bottom and centimeters cubed on top, so our grams cancel out. The key to unit conversion and dimensional analysis is units canceling out, canceling out. So it's 2.16 grams per one centimeter cubed. So we plug those values in. And now we do 93.2 divided by 2.16, and we get 43.1 centimeters cubed. All right? And that, my friends, finally, is the end of the chapter one lecture, which would have taken me probably about three days of class time based on the time of this lecture in order to cover. The end.